Now we're going to discuss what is liberty, when to intervene, when not to. Please give it up. Please welcome to the stage Jeffrey Lieberman, the Lawrence E. Cole Professor and Chair of Psychiatry at Columbia University, also the past president of the American Psychi Psychiatric Association, and Harvey Rosenthal, Executive Director of the New York Association of the Psychiatric Rehabilitation Services. Harvey and Jeffrey, please join me. Hey, I just have to start with a cool thing about Harvey first. I ask him, tell me something cool that no, you know, people would be really love And he says, the, the coolest thing about my life is that I went to a Jimi Hendrix birthday party. No one can beat that. That's, there's just. I asked Jeffrey, what's the coolest thing about you? I play tennis. He went to Jimi Hendrix birthday party. Take my hand. I I'm just up wanna, one already. Yeah, it's really, really cool. I was in, Woods, uh, I was in Woodstock. Yeah, you're, now the competition begins. <laughs> okay, so let's start here. I, you know, we're having uncomfortable, but thus far, you know, occasionally humorous conversations, serious conversations, but, but doing so in a way. And I think the two of you represent some of the, uh, uh, one, of the one of the larger divides right now, which is, for those people that are, are, are within the system but trying to find a journey uh, and, and you know, have challenges, Harvey, you're advocating uh, a, a much more hands-off, a much more voluntary system, a much more wraparound system. And as I understand it, Jeffrey, you're saying we need more intervention. We need, uh, even in some cases, a more coercive set of constraints around some people reacting to some of the violence that we've seen in Newtown and some of the bases where society has become concerned about those that are having uh, episodes from, from taking the lives of others. But I want to start with Harvey, so, make your case. The first thing I want to say is in no way am I advocating for hands off, quite the opposite. You know, I've, I've worked in this field for 40 years. I started my career as a patient in a mental hospital. I then worked in a state hospital and I've worked ever since to help people get out and stay out of hospital. And, all those years, I, I've seen a system that actually ha is too hands-off, is not working to engage, is not working to leave the office. I've seen so often people say, well, they're not compliant, they're not inherent, what can we do? And so what, what is society not doing that it needs to be doing in your frame of, of, of dealing with these Society challenges? or this field that we're talking no, yeah, about? Yeah, well, this, well, the field and society, I guess. I mean, are they, I guess there are different steps. Well, I do, in terms of this field, I don't want to attack folks out here, and I, I have been. There you are a lot more of them than there are of you, so. What's that? <laughs> what? That's right. That's yeah. right. But I do want to challenge us because I think for so many years, we have aimed so low and we have held ourselves not accountable enough and not putting everything on the street that we have. I in no way am about hands off. I think we, we've just proposed a model in New York that would uh, create an intensive, immediate, and sustained response, but voluntary, mm -hmm. but one that really sustains and stays in the game. And I think we can do that for so many people. For, I, I would challenge, I think we can do it for really everybody that I've seen and worked with over the years. So to bring in the cops and the courts is again, a, a sign of failure. This is more about system failure than patient failure. Now I know you both cared, you know, in, in very deep ways about uh, folks that are challenged, about, about, about the patients that we've talked about, about people that, that um, need these wraparound services. But Jeffrey, you've written some major pieces saying we, we can't wait for that world that Harvey's described and we need to take a different course. So take, you know, share with us your views. Well, Harvey, you know, I came out here thinking we would disagree and we're actually agreeing and I was hoping that two old Jewish white guys could find something to disagree about. But um, <clears throat> I think that, you know, the... the I, I, I'll find something. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like Jimi Hendrix too, so it's yeah. not going to be that. But um, I think what we're really uh, stuck on is a, um, a situation whereby, from a clinical perspective, there's really little question in my mind that a more uh, proactive approach to providing care to individuals who are severely affected by their symptoms to the point that their cognitive functioning has been compromised 
is, the best, is in their best interest and is in society's best interest. The problem comes because there, this runs up against two historical, one imperative and the other unfortunate accident. And, and that is, the historical imperative is, is that this country, more than any other country in the world, was founded on a principle of individual freedom and rights. Personal autonomy, self-determination, freedom of expression, and even to the point where the rights of the individual, when there's a question, are elevated and supersede those of society as a whole. So that's one thing. So this, by its nature of trying to proactively provide care when somebody may not be entirely understanding why or accepting of it, really runs up against that. The second thing is, is that it happens to a historically vulnerable population. Uh, those individuals with mental disabilities. And in the past, they have been abused in a variety of ways. And they've been abused by healthcare professionals who have therefore kind of not gained trust and credibility. So there's greater reluctance than there would otherwise be to hand over any type of greater authority to provide care uh, uh, when an individual is not wholly participating in it of their own free will. So why, if you see that some of these patients have been abused, uh, Harvey's written compellingly that oftentimes patients are, more are, are, are much more victims of violence than they are perpetrators of violence. But I, I've read what you've written recently, and you're very critical uh, uh, of, of many in your profession uh, for exactly reasons, but yet you still wrote that statutory mechanisms like assisted outpatient treatment have been enacted in 45 states. This in, they enable, enable doctors to obtain a court order that requires severely mental, mentally ill patients who meet certain legal criteria if they're unable to care for themselves or unwilling to take medication to adhere to treatment, et cetera. And you go on with the sort of, this is the coercive element that I'm wondering whether Harvey supports, but you advocate, but you advocate it within a system in which you've been very, very critical of many of the primary stakeholders in that well, profession. Well, well look, um, I mean, we have to deal with where we are in history. And uh, uh, the point where we are is that in the 21st century, the field of mental health care has a vast array of treatments, both psychosocial, pharmacologic, neuromodulatory, that are as effective as any other field of medicine, cardiovascular disease, infectious disease, mm -hmm. oncology. Um, but this is a relatively recent development. Up until the latter part of the 20th century, the only treatments we had were either barbaric or completely uh, scientifically unfounded. And some bad things happened as a, as a consequence. Um, so the statutory mechanism has been kind of a, a kind of a crude, blunt force approach to address this issue. But let me just come at it from the other direction, which is if we don't have something that is able to provide care to people when there's not a meeting of the minds of it, and there are, I think, many intermediary mechanisms short of the legal uh, system and the police, um, what happens? Well, what happens is the attention is only paid to this glaring historic healthcare disparity when something really bad happens that gets the media's, mm -hmm. please don't take offense, uh, and the government's attention, such as these mass violent incidents that occur. So these mass violent incidents occurred and got everyone's attention, and legislation was proposed. Of course, nothing has actually been passed, but in frustration, President Obama enacts executive orders, and his executive orders call for certain enhancements of gun control rules, right. and. Uh, enhancement of the national criminal immediate background check system, but then he tacks from just this generic effort to keep guns out of the hands of people who might perpetrate crimes to one, one constituency, the mentally ill. And he says that people with mental illness, if they've been involuntarily hospitalized, that information should be shared with the national, whatever the acronym is, and for the so, Social so Security, furthering stigma, furthering, furthering consequences. And, and the Social yeah. Security Administration should right. make plans to turn over the identities of individuals who are getting disability for mental illnesses to this background. So if we don't do something to try and address this issue when it's only a 
right. infinitesimally small number of people who have mental illness, even if their judgment is compromised, who end up doing violent things. This is what happens. So, Harvey, I want you to respond on the coercive element of the New York Times piece that Jeffrey wrote. I didn't read this piece, so I can't comment uh, on it. Okay. <laughs> I've got it here for you if you want. No, well, I'm just joking. Okay. But, but, so, but, uh, but on, on, on the broad issue of, of given what Jeffrey just described is we've got to start with what we've got. And given, given the realities we have today, would you advocate some element where there's got to be an intervention or a suspension or a curtailment of liberty? We're talking about liberty here with regards to uh, patients and the course they take. Is there a point at which you would agree that, that suspending that liberty for some makes sense? I think we have involuntary inpatient commitment to suspend somebody's liberty when they're a danger to self or others. Hmm. So I'm not contesting that. I also don't contest that people break the law, that they be held accountable for that or at least get help where appropriate. Um, but again, I guess my, my main premise is the premise you're saying here is that because we're not re the right kind of system, we have no choice but to use this tool called outpatient. I'm not saying that. I'm asking. Well, I don't yeah, know if Jeff's even saying it, but I've heard it said. Yeah. And no, I'm, there, no, there's intermediary measures. We, we just don't use them sufficiently or effectively. But let me give you a concrete. So, so why no, should we blame the patient and bring right, the, we shouldn't, the we shouldn't. cops and the courts we, involved? Uh, let, let's, let, let's get away from uh, concepts and uh, abstract uh, ideas. Let's talk about a concrete example. Okay. I have faced this situation recently. In our OB clinic, there was a, a pregnant woman who uh, had prior history of depression, and she had a relapse, and so she has recurrent psychotic depression. She thinks that her twins, which she's pregnant with, are uh, incarnates of the devil, and she wants an abortion. She doesn't want treatment. She wants an abortion. She's not harming anybody. She's living at home, quietly psychotic, what do you do? She's a danger to her children, is that what you're saying? I presume so, but she says she wants an abortion. You know, I mean, it's the right again, of women I mean, in this country to debating, have an abortion, right? I think we're debating, I suppose, inpatient commitment versus outpatient. So that's a Out, question Outpatient is predictive. Inpatient is if you have somebody who's gonna harm somebody, I think that's, that ship is sailed. Forget, already... forget the term commitment, we're talking about treatment. We're talking about right to refuse treatment or treatment of the individual over their objection. Again, if the person's a danger to their own children, I think the law and it's and the, the woman's right to abortion. But her abortion, her reason for an abortion, isn't because she's not married to the person. It's not timely for her to have children. Her reason is a delusional one. I, I've covered that. I don't know what to tell you about it. Right. So we have. I think what you're having is very in the two minutes we have left. Um, I, I want to I tell was a afraid, story, yeah, I mean, if I can tell yeah, go a ahead. story. So I'm working in an uh, outpatient clinic some years ago. I get called to the home to tell you a story of, a, of a, 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 a Jewish guy, by the way, who had come back from college and had locked himself in his room. His family didn't know what to do. I got there and I looked through the keyhole and he was standing like this. And he kept saying, I say to the court tapes. He felt like he was on trial, like mm. all the time. And I kept coming back, Jeff. And because it's speak of, of cultural competence, they were Jewish, I was Jewish. I entered that family. I right. didn't go away. I came back again and again. And eventually, he, he uh, saw me not as the prosecuting attorney, which he had called me, as his defense attorney. Mm -hmm. And I was able to get him to open you the door connected. and come out. And I didn't have right. to kick it down. We didn't have to shove a needle in him. But here's the sad story. Right. The other corollary is, yeah. what did I have to offer him? They took him to the hospital and they gave him medication. And that wasn't enough. That wasn't really anywhere near enough. And he killed himself in the state hospital, oh. like several months afterwards. So for me, there's two sides to that story. So it sets up and frames there's very well. There's two sides to the, the story. One of them is you really can't, you have to be relentless. Yeah. You have to throw everything you have. The, the people's lives are in jeopardy. And yet, he didn't kill himself in the house. It was the right. treatment that failed. We're, we're, we're right near the end of our, our, our session, but you know, one of the things I want to ask both of you to do in very short form, um, I once interviewed a prominent Saudi ambassador, uh, and he had gone to school at Georgetown University and been a student of Father Healy there, and I said, tell me what the most interesting point in your education was. And he said, Father Healy gave us an assignment in class where we had to argue the Israeli position on 
issues, and our Israeli or Jewish students had to argue the Arab position dealing with each other. He said it's the hardest thing in his life that he had ever done. He got a C. Father Healy told him he was disappointed. But he said it put himself in the shoes of others with whom he disagreed. And I found it one of the most interesting life things to do when I'm often you know, talking to people who have different views. And we just, just for a moment, as you've listened to each other, and as we've had this set of slightly uncomfortable conversations, but people with different frames trying to sort out how human lives, uh, uh, not just a single life, but many lives, and getting the system better, what do you think, Harvey, the strongest points of Jeffrey's perspective are? And Jeffrey, can you share with us where you would make common cause with Harvey? Put, put each other, put, put yourself in So you in want the to argue shoot. his case? Yeah. I think people suffer. I think they, they are sometimes unable to understand or do much about it. I think they're apprehensive and suspicious. I agree that people have symptoms. I think families are heartbroken about that. Oh, I'm supposed to, now I was going to switch to my argument. But, <laughs> uh, so I understand that great frustration. I'm a parent of children that have, had, have suffered, and I want help, and I want the system to come in, and I don't want them to give me about they have rights, and I can't come, and what can we do? Uh, I want to know that if a provider comes to the house, and they offer something, and my son refuses it, someone will send somebody else and offer something different and better. Jeffrey, put yourself in Harvey's shoes. Well, first, there are so many stories which illustrate uh, the dilemma uh, that this situation, uh, I mean, that, that this you know, question raises. Uh, I wish we had time to tell them all. But Harvey is exactly right. It's not such a, a draconian solution to dealing with uh, uh, the problem of you know, right to refuse treatment or treatment over objection. It's much more nuanced, and it's vastly preferable to be able to spend the time, gain the confidence, be seen as an ally of the individual rather than to have some stormtrooper approach. He's um, right. Um, <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Lieberman I, 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 I and Harvey Rosenthal. <laughs> Thank you. Stay right here, guys.